Welcome to the lecture of COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. This lecture has been made for the general awareness of the students and the public at large. My name is Dr. Sanjeev Pandey. I am an associate professor in botany, specializes in microbiology at Banwari Lal Bhavatiya College, Asansol, which is in West Bengal, India. Now let us talk about the virus. There are many questions coming in the mind of everyone that what is this COVID-19 virus is? Where from and how did it originated? How this virus causes the disease and how can we stop it from further spread? So let us see one by one. COVID-19 is actually a name given by the WHO. Its full form is Coronavirus Disease 2019 and its actual name is SARS-CoV-2 which stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2 because it is the second time that this virus has attacked. The first one was in 2002. We will talk about that. The name coronavirus originated from the thing that the virus appears like a crown under the electron microscope and it measures about 120 nanometer in diameter and its genome is made up of a positive single strand RNA and the virus looks like this it is an envelope virus with uh, many protein like spikes on the membrane envelope the main spike that is uh, the glycoprotein base is very very important because this is the glycoprotein or spike which actually launches on the host cell that is alveolar cell and binds with the host cell receptor that is called ACE2 angiotensin converting enzyme 2 and there are other uh, proteins also spike proteins like E protein, M protein, E stands for envelope, M stands for uh, membrane like this there is an HE protein and this is the spiral RNA which is coated with a spiral protein capsule also so this is the structure of the virus at this moment Virus originates from uh, a bat, which is uh, which contains many types of coronavirus. It has been said, and this virus uh, it uh, came to the human being via a uh, intermediate host called pangolin. Now it is doubtful. The similar incidences that occurred uh, earlier to that, this virus was the first one was this SARS-CoV, which occurred in 2002 in China, and more than 8,000 people were uh, infected by this virus also. The lethality rate was high, but it was not that contagious. It spread the intermediate host for this virus was a civet cat. Uh, in 2013, the MERS, which is also a coronavirus, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, uh, it occurred in, in 2013 in the Caribbean Peninsula. That's why the name is Middle East. And the intermediate host was a camel. So basically, human being acquired this virus from bad via a secondary host which may be any animal. Within the animal, this intermediate or secondary host, the virus recombines to develop or evolve into a new species, which might be uh, very, very dangerous like this one. How does this virus spread? Now, let us see that we know already that the virus spreads through droplets. What are droplets? Droplets are very small uh, water-like water particles that come out when we sneeze or we cough. Uh, when the size of these particles are less than 5 micrometers, these, these particles carry virus particles actually and in this virus particle, these particles the size of these particles are less than 5 micrometer then it can migrate longer it can go up to 2 meter or more and can infect a healthy host the other way of contamination uh, is uh, direct contact with the individual infected individual or via indirect contact by touching uh, inanimate objects the fomites that the infected individual comes into contact so if you keep uh, away from these things by wearing masks and gloves and, and having a changed lifestyle, then you might get protected from this virus. This is the only way at this moment. Now, the disease development, it is not that all the people who are exposed to SARS-CoV-2 get infected and not all infected persons develop severe respiratory illness. However, if a person develops uh, the disease, there are three stages. Stage 1 is the incubation period, which is 2 to 14 days. But the virus is undetectable at this stage. Uh, the stage two is uh, is non-serious but symptomatic period, and the virus is detectable at this stage. And stage three is very very dangerous. It is severe respiratory symptomatic stage uh, with high viral load, and this is the stage with, if one enters into that this stage, it is very very difficult to come back from this stage. The immune response uh, occurs in two phases about this virus. The phase one is. Uh, it includes the first two stages of the disease when the disease is in the incubation period as well as in symptomatic but uh, the virus but it has not caused, caused uh, very serious um, symptoms during this phase our adaptive immunity may eliminate the virus and disease does not progress to the third stage 
uh, the strategy is like uh, boosting the immunity may be very very helpful at this stage. In the stage two, what happens uh, when this um, stage one and stage two fail? Then the immune system enters into the phase two, and in during this phase, the virus enters into a massive destruction in the lungs. It causes the damaged cells induce innate inflammatory response. In fact, the inflammation is so high; it is called hyperinflammation because of it. It leads to acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is the principal cause of uh, death. Mortality. So, how can we handle the situation? The situation can be handled by flattening the curve. What does that mean? This means everywhere you are hearing this flattening the curve. This means uh, a number of patients uh, or in infected individuals at a particular time. If it is high, then the hospitals and other healthcare facilities will become crowded and the care, individual care that can be taken, will not be possible. So, if the number of cases per day is less, then the healthcare facilities can be made available to everyone and uh, and at suitable stage could be achieved. That's why it is being said that flatten the curve. How can you flatten the curve? You can flatten the curve by staying at home, by not contacting the disease. That is the only thing. Now let us talk about the treatment strategies or remedies about this virus. Uh, I must say here that this part of the lecture should not be considered as any sort of prescription. It is basically or purely made for study purpose, for awareness and what is going on, just to have a knowledge about that. And, mm, and this has been created uh, some size on the basis of the literature that are available in the web. The first uh, strategy that can be used is um, in during the period of incubation of uh, this viral infection is the administration of interferon alpha in the form of aerosols. Uh, one can inhale twice per night uh, during these 14 days of incubation. And there is a combination therapy of it also, interferon alpha in combination to drive up the day, uh, probably in steroid. Uh, which um, helps to boost the immune system and decrease the inflammation. Uh, the second strategy is to uh, block the entry of the virus into the alveolar cell where it replicates. This can be done uh, since there is no drug directly available to block the ACE2 receptor. Uh, there is another molecule present uh, beside that that is also a membrane bound protein that is a serine protease called TMPSS. Uh, this, the function of this protease is to break the S glycoprotein, surface glycoprotein, the spike protein, with the help of which the virus binds with the S2 receptor and enters into the cell. Uh, this uh, protease, it breaks the S protein into S1 and S2 fragments and then the virus enters. And so if you inhibit this uh, protease, serine protease or purine protease, then entry of the virus can be blocked. And this has been done by some Japanese doctors uh, using mapamostat mesylate. And the other drug that is uh, very, very crucial at the moment and people are talking about this is the remdesivir. This drug and many other similar drugs like lopinavir and ritonavir, they inhibit the RDRP enzyme that is RNA dependent RNA polymerase enzyme. This enzyme is required for the replication of the virus from a plus strand to minus strand and then again plus strands of the RNA genomes of the virus. So if you block this, this enzyme is not present in, in host cell, in human, human cell. Uh, RNA dependent RNA polymerase is not available, so this is a target uh, and that can be blocked by MDBC and since I have been found in this uh, with this drug. The next strategy is uh, is to block the formation of hyaluronic acid which is formed um, during this infection and this hyaluronic acid absorbs water and forms a jelly-like substance and blocks the gaseous exchange that occurs between the blood capillaries and the alveolar sacs. Uh, the main function of the alveolar sac is to make the gaseous exchange because of which uh, our blood is purified and um, by the formation of this hyaluronic acid and uh, which which is enhanced during this infection and if you decrease the formation of hyaluronic acid by some way uh, a relief will be found in you know, gaseous exchange the acute syndrome can be decreased uh, to a greater extent and this can be done by using a medical grade hyaluronic acid enzyme which can dissolve this hyaluronic acid or hyaluronan formation thereby decreasing the acute syndrome. There is another drug which uh, inhibits the synthesis of this hyaluronic acid by blocking the enzyme has to hyaluronic acid synthesis 2. This is called 4-methyl-amediferone. This drug is, uh, is obtained from a plant called Pusidani radix and Chinese scientists uh, and doctors have used this uh, the extract of Pusidani radix. In India, I saw that the equivalent um, plant that can, that produces 4-methyl-amediferone in, in good quantity is Acacia nilotica, which we call baboon. So this can be a drug of choice in combination to others. Hydroxychloroquine, which is being now being the drug of choice, it, how does it act? It's, um, uh, it acts by 
various mechanisms. So there are four types of mechanisms by which it acts, but it is so it has got side effects. So the use of it has to be always uh, done under the supervision of a physician and the doctor, very good doctor. So how does it work? First of all, it alkalitizes the lysosomes. Uh, the lysosomes are the cell organelles that bind with the endosome. When the virus enters, it forms endosome or phagosome. And uh, the lysosome combines with the phagosome to form phagolysosome and then it processes the antigenic part of the virus and, uh, and, and presents it um, on the surface of the antigen presenting cell. These are, this is the antigen presenting cell in which the mechanism is going on. So if you take hydroxychloroquine, it will, uh, it will alkal alkalitize, it will increase the pH of the lysosome because of which the First of all, this fusion will not occur, and secondly, if it occurs, the enzymatic activity of the lysosome will be will be disturbed or inhibited because of which presentation of the epitope will not occur properly. So this is one uh, site of inhibition by hydroxychloroquine. Another thing is that it binds with the salic acid co-receptor. Salic acid co-receptors are present uh, just beside the ACE2 uh, receptors, and uh, it, this receptor is also required while the virus is uh, internalized into the cell. So, uh, hydroxychloroquine by binding with this uh, salic acid co-receptors, it blocks the entry of the virus into the cell. Uh, the next thing is that hydroxychloroquine and also chloroquine also. So both are similar, but hydroxychloroquine being larger in size, it is not absorbed in the, in the blood and, and its side effects is relatively less than the chloroquine. So, uh, the hydroxychloroquine also acts as an ionophore. It is a hydrophobic molecule and so it can transfer ions like zinc into the alveolar cell and so uh, the zincs are the inhibitors of RDRP enzyme. So by this mechanism also it decreases the replication of the virus and it reduces the inflammation. The main thing about this disease is the, the hyperinflammation that causes the respiratory syndrome that we understand as um, acute respiratory distress syndrome and the cause of the disease. The next thing which is at present being practiced is the plasma therapy. Uh, this plasma therapy is basically a passive way of immunization. It, um, uh, it involves the extraction of the blood plasma from the convalescent patients, that means the patients which have recovered from the disease and they contain uh, antibodies against this virus within their plasma and if it is delivered into a patient who is suffering with, with under severe condition, then this might provide a passive response, passive immune response to that patient. So that's all about this uh, COVID-19 video lecture. Uh, here are the references from my collected this data, these informations. And thank you very much for your present listening. Mm -hmm.